rise of institution, the impact of institution, and rethinking big things. And later, we'll back to this presentation with Professor Beck's discussion, and let's hear from the second presenter, Professor Patricia Kedek, please. Good morning. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is the development of human rights lawyering in South Korea, and this is more or less, uh, you know, lawyering for human rights in a nutshell. Um, it's ironic that I'm standing here talking about this today because when I was in law school, I was pretty certain I was going into corporate finance. And so <laughs> this goes to show how uh, we can uh, always come around to human rights later um, once uh, we decide that, uh, that uh, corporate finance is not as exciting uh, of an area. Um, let's move on here. Okay, so the questions that I'd like us to think of broadly today as we, as we um, walk through this topic is um, how has human rights advocacy diffused in the legal profession in the last several decades in Korea? And does the legal profession use other discourse, other language besides human rights in advancing rights? And how has the legal profession influenced the development of human rights protection in Korea. So these are the broad questions we can think about as I more or less uh, walk you through the development, the evolution of human rights lawyering in, in South Korea. I think some concepts have to be clarified uh, <laughs> because human rights is quite a broad um, concept, and so, you know, for purposes of this discussion only, I'll be really referring to human rights as enshrined in the, in the international uh, human rights instruments and treaties. Um, diffusion also, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the term diffusion, actually, because that's also quite broad, and, and are we talking about discourse, are we talking about numbers of legal institutions, are we talking about, um, you know, expansive methods of, of leveraging uh, human rights, are we talking about um, the discursive frameworks of, of human rights, diffusion that covers a lot of territory, um, so I think we need to figure out how to narrow, narrow and specify that today, and, and we'll probably get lots of examples today, um, and maybe be able to synthesize a little bit towards the end of, end of the conference. But my job today is really to talk about human rights lawyering, and, and what does that mean? That's actually also quite a broad, broad area, because in, in uh, the field of the legal profession, we use it interchangeably with many other phrases. For example, activist lawyering, or cause lawyering, social justice lawyering, public interest lawyering, rights lawyering, <laughs> constitutional progressive, even rebellious lawyering. So it's, it's quite a, a, it's, you know, just to confine it to human rights lawyering is, is actually not enough. There are, there are other uh, conceptual frameworks when we talk about rights and lawyering and advocating for rights. So um, there are other discursive um, frameworks out there that I'm going to be touching upon today. Um, as far as uh, human rights lawyering, the best definition I've seen so far is, is provided by Dina Hurwitz of the University of, of Virginia Law School. And this is to let you know that human rights lawyering is not just about representing one client in one case in terms of trying to protect a certain right, um, but that it goes beyond that, that there are a lot of advocacy strategies. And so this might include um, impact litigation, uh, legal assistance, counseling, of course, um, legislative advocacy, putting forth bills, drafting new laws, revising, amending laws, um, but also non-legal work. So human rights lawyering actually can include a lot of non-legal work, which could be community outreach, um, working with the media, investigative reporting, fact-finding, flying to another country, uh, interviewing, interviewing those who are maybe displaced um, uh, in terms of their land or property, and, in, and not just working in a law firm either. You know, this might include working with NGOs. It might include working with legal clinics, um, uh, with government agencies, and so forth. So it's actually a very broad concept, and I want us to 
open our mind up to the, the fact that human rights lawyering is, uh, is, a, is actually a very big spectrum of, of what can be done. The, the history of human rights lawyering in South Korea, therefore, ends up actually being very, very rich if we're talking about broadening this spectrum of how we look at human rights advocacy. And there are many ways to sort of categorize it, but I thought the easiest way would be just in, in terms of um, history and generations. So if we look at human rights lawyers in South Korea, you could probably um, more or less categorize them into three, three generations. There's the first generation, which we're looking at the 1960s, 1970s, um, and you have the specific term, inkwan pyonosa. So inkwan is human rights, pyonosa is lawyer, and you have that specific term in Korea, inkwan pyonosa, in the 1960s and 1970s. The second generation, 1980s, 1990s, this is, you know, with the democratic transition in 1980. 1987, 1988, where a lot of the NGOs um, start sprouting up and a lot of uh, lawyers groups start um, coming together, networking as well. Um, this would be the second generation, second generation where you're looking at uh, citizens' movements, lawyers starting to work with citizens' movements. Um, and then we enter the third generation, the last decade, third generation where you have some public interest law groups separately forming. And I'll, and I'll basically be talking about these three generations. We're going to uh, walk through these three generations. There are a lot of institutions and actors and networks to consider in uh, human rights lawyering in South Korea. Since we're talking about the legal profession, I think the, the first uh, appropriate place to start would actually be with the Korean Bar Association. Uh, and then we have Lawyers for a Democratic Society, which is a network of, of lawyers in law firms or in public interest law groups um, who've come together to work on, on different cases. Uh, another NGO I'll talk about, PSPD, People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy. Um, I'll talk about some public interest law firms, private law firms, um, mentioned government briefly, and, and law schools. I know that's a lot on there, but don't worry, we're not going to go too, uh, too exhaustive into, into each of these. The Korean Bar Association has a very deep history with, with human rights advocacy in South Korea. Um, Lee Byung-nin was the president of the Korean Bar Association and Seoul Bar Association um, a long time ago, from the beginning, the post-war era. So this is in the 1950s, 1960s, and his tenure was quite long in both the Korean Bar Association and the Seoul Bar Association. And at the time, he was quite a leader in terms of promoting human rights. And he was the one who had mentioned uh, you know, the, this concept of human rights at the time. And this was put into the, the regulation, Bar Association regulation. It's also language that's in the Lawyers Act, in the Lawyers Act. So you'll see language on furthering um, that the mission of lawyers is to actually help protect uh, human rights and to further social justice. So that this is actually an overarching professional ethic um, that's that's in the, the bar regulations. Whether that's actually implemented on an individual level for everybody, that's another question. But it's, it's in there, uh, it's in there. Korean Bar Association also has many committees, subcommittees. Human Rights Committee has been there from the beginning. It's been there a long, long time. And, and I'll talk about that too as well. Minbyun, how many of you have heard of Minbyun? The faculty, I'm sure, <laughs> the faculty has. Uh, students, I'm wondering about the students. Minbyun would be the, the, the group that formed in 1988, Lawyers for a Democratic Society. That's, that's the, the English equivalent of it. Um, but what's, what's very interesting is that the members of the Human Rights Committee of the Korean Bar Association were really the ones who had formed Minbyun. So Minbyun was formed after de democratic transition, and in 1988, that was when it, you know, these NGOs were permitted 
uh, to be uh, formed. And so you had... Um, Oh, I'm missing a slide. Anyway, you had Minjan coming. Oh, I'm missing a slide. Okay. So basically about 50 members coming together and forming Minbian. Um, what galvanized Minbian was actually the death of Yi Byung-nin, the person, the picture I showed you earlier. And so that galvanized the group, and so, and so they said, we need to, uh, you know, honor, honor the idea of, of our role in advancing human rights and social justice. So let's go ahead and form Minbian. Okay. So Minbian was very uh, active in the 19... 1990s, late 1980s, 1990s. Another another group NGO that came into play in the 1990s um, with respect to human rights advocacy, well, rights advocacy, um, is PSPD, People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy. And who was the one that helped form this? Who's that a picture of? <laughs> the mayor of Seoul, right? And so he was very instrumental in helping to form PSPD in the mid-1990s. This was when there was quite a focus on citizens' rights in terms of social and economic rights. Um, he's a lawyer. He's an activist. I spoke to him and I said, Are you, you know, what do you see yourself as? And he says, I'm an activist first and a lawyer second. Um, but he had helped to form PSPD. Um, and... And he was the one who actually introduced, really started to introduce the phrase of public interest law instead of human rights in this period, in the 1990s. Um, public interest law really came into play with this group, PSPD. So within PSPD, it's an NGO, uh, but he actually encouraged a lot of lawyers to come in and be active on the many subcommittees that they had. Um, and uh, created the Public Interest Law Center. So that was the word, Public Interest Law Center. Um, and in using, in using the language public interest law, um, he was very clear, very expressive about saying, we now have a public interest law movement, much like Ralph Nader in the US in the 1960s, uh, using the same terminology. Um, so, so the idea was to use law, and he said as a weapon, and as a tool. We're going to use the law to keep the state uh, in check. So that means we are going to litigate, we are going to take cases, we're going to, we're going to uh, petition uh, the legislature, we're going to do media outreach, awareness. This sounds a lot like the definition we saw earlier of human rights lawyering. It's the same thing um, that's happening here. but the phrase is public interest lawyering. PSPD had many lawyers in the leadership, so I actually looked at who, who was on each committee and found out that actually one third of the operations committee um, happened to be lawyers or law professors and that one half of the steering committee were also legal professionals. Very heavy, um, legal leadership, actually, in that NGO. This phenomenon was actually replicated in other NGOs as well. So other NGOs, uh, Citizens Coalition for Economic Justice, environmental groups, trade unions, other uh, consumer women's groups, also started to create internal legal centers where they embedded lawyers to actually help mobilize uh, their respective causes. Okay, so this brings us into the, the decade of 2000, where we actually have smaller public interest law firms, not NGOs. So we're moving beyond just networked groups and NGOs with embedded lawyers, okay? Now we're actually seeing the sprouting of nonprofit public interest law firms for the first time. So this was in the last, um, last 10 years, basically where we're seeing small public interest law firms um, merging, uh, emerging on their, on their own. 
The most um, notable is Kongam. Kongam called itself the first public interest lawyers group. It's, but it's related to PSPD, the, the group we just talked about, because there was one uh, young lawyer who had approached Pagwansun, Mayor Pagwansun, uh, and said, I would, like to, I would like to work as a human rights lawyer, as a public interest lawyer. And so um, at that time, Pagwansun had, had left PSPD and formed the Beautiful Foundation, had some money and said, well, let's form, then let's form Kongam. Let's form the first public interest lawyers group in Korea, which, which is, um, is what happened. And they just had their ninth year anniversary uh, a few months ago. So um, people weren't sure, is this really going to work? Um, it's, it's so new, it's so small, but they, they're, they're still small, <laughs> but they're thriving. Another recent one, just within the last couple of years, uh, Kongam has eight lawyers. Advocates for Public Interest Law, Kongik Bub Center Appeal, has uh, four lawyers. They just started up a couple of years ago as well. Um, there's another one, Hope and Law, just started up uh, uh, last year, I think, as well, um, with six lawyers, just newly graduated lawyers. So, so you're seeing this, this recent trend where there are some who are just trying to do it full time on their own. And this, this is really the third generation of human rights lawyers, public interest lawyers that we're seeing now. Kongam is very savvy at, uh, at uh, presenting their image in the media and being very active. So um, there are uh, a lot of great photo, opportunity <laughs> photo ops <laughs> that they have. What's also interesting is that for all this time, they've called themselves a public interest lawyers group. And now even law students say, I want to be a public interest lawyer instead of I want to be a human rights lawyer. So we now we're language has actually um, been absorbed by the legal community and, and with law students who are only starting um, to become legal professionals. But uh, just recently they became, they separated uh, independently from the beautiful foundation sponsorship. And so now legally they're their own foundation. And if you actually go to their website today, it doesn't say Kongam Public Interest Lawyers Group. Now it says Kongam Human Rights Law Foundation. So that's also very interesting. That's that's actually using the that's that's actually sticking with the the concept of human rights, um, but also being friendly to the term of public interest law. Appeal, same thing. So when they came up with their name, what is it? Advocates for public interest law. It's not human rights law. Um, public interest law has really um, been accepted now as as uh, the language of choice for for the young young legal professionals, um, and I and I like the title appeal because it sounds like you're going to appeal whatever cases uh, that you don't win in the first round anyway. Okay, and what but what kinds of issues do they work on? Uh, they very much work on international human rights issues in terms of refugee advocacy, trafficking issues, detention, rights of children. And so these groups are very active. They're not just working uh, in Seoul, for example. They are, they are networking regionally with other um, similar public interest law groups. And you know, they do fly to Geneva. They do um, submit uh, periodic reports. Um, so they're very, they're very active in terms of international legal mobilization and, of course, also domestically with representing clients and doing case research and also working with law schools, law school legal clinics. So this leaves us with private law firms. What are the private law firms doing? What are the, what are the lawyers doing um, in the private sector? Um, pro bono for the public good. Um, this means giving legal representation for those who really can't afford it and usually for the underprivileged, uh, although not necessarily. Um, so where do you find private lawyers working on behalf of, of rights advocacy? Uh, quite a few in small and medium firms. They might be Minbyan members, for example. Uh, large firms, 
Uh, just within the last five years, you'll see that many larger firms are creating pro bono uh, sections in their law firms. So um, this is showing some emphasis on law firms also saying, yes, we're interested in human rights, yes, we're interested in uh, social justice, representing clients that don't have a lot of money. Um, this is a trend that's, that you see actually coming from international law firms globally, and it's, it's now um, reached South Korea as well, where you see the legal profession in the private sector um, taking up this, this same um, approach in trying to uh, say, we're not just greedy bastards, <laughs> we, we also want to help people too, right? Okay, and, and today the model law firm is Peggy Min Lee, Tae Pyongyang. Uh, this is a pretty large law firm in the Gangnam area, of course, and uh, they've, they've taken it a step further. So it's not just lawyers who work on some pro bono cases, they've actually set up a separate foundation it's in the same building, and they call it Tongchen Foundation. But this foundation has taken a bigger institutional role in uh, Seoul and in uh, South Korea generally in trying to promote pro bono, not just for its own lawyers at Peggy Min Lee, but in working with, for example, legal clinics um, and trying to raise scholarships for, for students who want to be uh, public interest lawyers in the future um, in trying to work with uh, you know some of these uh, disempowered communities, refugees, North Korean escapees, um, and so forth, dis disabled and so forth. So uh, Tongchen Foundation is actually um, doing a lot. They're doing a lot. I, I work with them too, and, and I'm amazed with their staff, uh, all the projects that they're they're trying to to um, tackle. So you notice the picture is a little bit different from the other pictures of Kongam and Appeal. Kongam and Appeal, you have sort of this young, fresh look with everybody wearing t-shirts and jeans. And here we have everybody in suits with their, <laughs> with their badges. It looks very corporate. So there's quite a different type of identity here that we're trying to balance uh, in the public sector. It's, it's uh, you know, it seems a little bit more, more casual and, and cause focused, whereas um, here, Tongchen Foundation, uh, they're in a, 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 you know, they're in an ambiguous role, right? They have to sort of temper the corporate aspects, the money-making part of uh, their identity with um, what they're trying to signal or with what they're trying to pursue um, for the public interest in, in Korea. So that was established not too long ago, 2009. So it's a very young organization. Um, yeah, so if, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm really just skimming the surface of a lot of these groups. So if you have further questions, we'll, we'll take it during Q&A. Okay, the government, uh, I, I don't have a lot to say here, but there are um, efforts within government also to work on providing legal assistance to, to those who um, find hard to get access to it. Ministry of Justice also is working on um, trying to, to promote awareness and furtherance of human rights. And then you have the National Human Rights Commission, which I'm sure we'll hear about today, later on. Uh, but I do want to end talking about legal education because we do have the new law school system here. It's in its fifth year. Um, what, is, what is the law school system doing with respect to international human rights? Um, I, you'll find it in the curriculum, of course. You'll find faculty members working on international human rights in most of the law schools. Um, but, but the next stage really is, I think, at the clinical stage, because as we know in other countries, especially uh, like the US, Canada, Australia, even um, China, um, Japan are our neighbors here, um, that clinical legal education has really taken off globally, but it's very, very new here. It's really just starting to emerge. Um, so, you know, what can law school clinics do with respect to international human rights or public interest lawyering? This is actually where Tongchen Foundation has really stepped in to try to work with law schools um, to help sort of lift uh, the, the clinical legal ed education aspect of, um, of uh, advocating for, for rights.
in uh, respective communities. And then there are also law student associations. So there are actually a number of law students who are really interested in human rights, public interest law, um, and doing a lot separately within their own associations. Again, networking with Kongam, Appeal, uh, many of the existing um, public interest law firms, and Tongchen Foundation as well, but also being creative on their own, trying to create um, some uh, case representation for, for communities that they're targeting, maybe uh, those who can't afford uh, or need help with medical assistance, for example, or um, street law for, for the youth or for homeless. So, so there, there's, there's a lot of uh, creative and innovative work really starting at the student, even grassroots level as well. Okay, so if I hope we have time to revisit some of these questions. Um, what I had mentioned earlier, how has human rights uh, advocacy diffused in the legal profession? You know, is there other discourse besides human rights? And how has the legal profession influenced the development of human rights? Well, this is a lot, <laughs> actually. But, but more or less, um, if we go back and look at the first generation, second generation, third generation categories that I told you about earlier, the first generation, you're really looking at human rights in terms of civil and political rights, right? The politi politicization of um, human rights. Um, the second generation, really looking at social and economic rights, um, but sort of shedding the, shedding the concept of human rights. Uh, the legal profession starts using the concept of public interest law Okay, at that point. Um, and then the third generation starts focusing on um, really looking at uh, groups that are non-citizens, refugees, migrant workers, um, and uh, other minorities that, that have issues with, with citizenship. Those who don't fall into the, the nice middle class, the, those who don't fall into um, having their, their social and economic rights secured. Um, so that's more or less the third generation. I think the fourth generation might just be the, the law students who are graduating now, who are now coming out with the mentality of, oh, there's sort of this pro bono professional ethic um, that we need to start to consider. So I think there's really a professionalization of the concept of human rights and public interest law that's happening um, in, in Korea. That, you know, we can talk about that as well. So language-wise, there, there are things to consider. Human rights, social justice, that's sort of the starting point. Um, but public interest law, I, I don't think we should leave that out of the equation when we're talking about lawyers in South Korea. And pro bono as well is, is uh, equally important. So overall, um, th these are very broad statements right now, but I do find that lawyers have actually been very critical agents working with social movements and citizens' movements, um, being, being part of, of the larger fabric of society and, and knowing how to mobilize the law and knowing how to leverage international human rights in, in um, knowing how to strategize domestically for causes. And, uh, and then in terms of, you know, does one thing lead to another? You know, I think there's been actually a very synergistic effect with lawyers um, uh, circulating and working within, within South Korean society in the last several decades. Okay, so I want to end there, actually. Uh, I, I know it's a lot uh, to chew on, but that's really the, the nutshell, I, the synopsis I have for you today, and we can discuss go deeper and discuss more of the details later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This is also a very, very uh, interesting presentation, especially to show us a new aspect, a new interpretation of a Korean contemporary society, focusing on, in terms of a human rights, but focusing on variation or changes of a legal profession's contribution also is messo. Okay. Um, let's see here from the Professor Kim, the third presenter.
have no slides, so I just asked to light the room a little bit. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to present my research. Uh, today, I will talk about my recent paper with my colleague at Griffith University. Um, and then this paper is forthcoming in the international organization next year. And then I'll move away a little bit from the human rights because I'm going to talk both human rights and corruption in this presentation. And then uh, the topic in the paper is a little bit of theoretical consideration about the diffusion models. So it's a little bit dry, but please bear with me um, for the presentation. In this paper, we explore the diffusion of two parallel international norms, which mandates the international duty to hold state leaders accountable for corruption and the human rights crimes. We argue that the development of these new norms is poorly explained by realist and neoliberal diffusion theories in international relations, while also highlighting a weaknesses in the recent social constructivist explanation of norm diffusion, which emphasizes agency at the expense of structure. The such explanations, we argue, have difficulty explaining the source of two new norms and the similarities between two norms. Also, these explanations treat norm entrepreneurs as prior to and separate from their normative environment. In contrast, we draw on a sociological institutionalism and present a more structural explanation. We argue that these two norms derive from an overarching modernist world culture to which privileges individual rights and responsibility as well as a rational legal authority. We argue that this normative structure was more generative of norm entrepreneurs than generated by them. Let me first briefly mention our background and research areas since these backgrounds information is important in explaining why we came up with an idea that links human rights and corruption. I study human rights with the perspective of transnational advocacy network theory. My focus has been on transitional justice, which is the issue relating to how to address the past to human rights violations after democratic transition or the resolution of war. My colleague at Griffith, Jason Sharman, on the other hand, studies international political economy, focusing on money laundering, tax havens, and corruption. In 2011, I invited Jason to the workshop I organized, and we were surprised to know that there are important overlaps between our respective topics, mainly because for the most part of human history, repressive leaders are almost always corrupt, and then corrupt leaders also tend to be repressive. We came up with three observations. The first, despite being a separate areas, the human rights and corruption both recently started to hold state leaders accountable for their crimes. With the Arab Spring in Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt, there has been a strong drive to hold leaders individually accountable, both for their corruption and human rights crimes. As many of you know, the atrocities in Libya not only provoked a uh, NATO intervention and the ISIS's indictment of Gaddafi, his son, and then the head of security, but even before all these actions, Switzerland froze 630 million dollars of uh, the fund controlled by Gaddafi and his sons, arguing that the Libyan public funds could otherwise be misused by these individuals. This followed earlier action by Switzerland and other countries to freeze the assets of Bin Ali and Mubarak after their, their regimes has been fallen. The second observation is that we also notice that the timing of diffusion of these two norms is almost identical. It started to rise in the early 1990s and rapidly diffused worldwide since 2000. Gaddafi was not the first one to engage in both corruption and human rights. Marcos, the Pinochet, and the Charles Taylor are a few examples before him. 
For a long time, the state leaders have enjoyed impunity, and this has been a strong norm. But now, this norm is replaced by the norm of accountability. And this is a revolutionary change that happened less than 20 years. This is a significant change. Before 1990, only a handful of former leaders had been indicted for such crimes. But since then, 67 heads of states from 47 uh, countries have been indicted. And ICTY and ICTR and ICC, International Criminal Courts, are the well-known international applications of these practices. The similarly, for corruption, international efforts have been made to recover the assets stolen by the former rulers of the Philippines, Nigeria, and Peru, to name a few. The regional agreement to combat corruption began to appear from the mid-1990s, and the UN Convention Against Corruption dates from 2005. The third observation is that despite these similarities, there has been no explicit coordination or the cooperation between the norm entrepreneurs in each sector. In addition, the, despite the international responses to each problem has evolved along the parallel tracks, the striking similarity between them have seldom been noted in either uh, the scholarly or the policy literature. Therefore, we started from the existing theories of diffusion in international relations in order to explain the diffusion of individual accountability norms in human rights and corruption. Realism, neoliberal institutionalism, which is a variant of the liberalism, and finally, social constructivism, or constructivism in short. The first, realism. For realist Norms diffuse when they promote or are consistent with the national interest of great powers. The realist accounts, however, cannot adequately explain why norms, which often stand in opposition to the interest of the strong states, such as protecting human rights and attacking corruption, should diffuse. As norms of individual accountabilities are incorporated into the domestic and international legal regimes, the government's freedom of action is significantly reduced. Good examples are recent cancellation of international travels of Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld in fear of getting arrested in foreign, on foreign soil. For democratic governments in particular, the breaking international and domestic legal obligation is difficult, embarrassing, or at least inconvenient. It seems implausible to reduce these norms to the tool of realpolitik. Although realpolitik may have favored leaving Pinochet unmolested during his trip to Britain in 19, uh, 1998, he was nevertheless arrested. Another interesting example is the Obiang family the ruler of Equatorial Guinea, Africa's third largest oil producer and a significant U.S. investment de destination. The Obiang government has an appalling record of human rights violation. The UN human rights reporter once mentioned in a newspaper interview, quote, they don't even hide a torture instrument. They were just on the table, unquote. In addition, for a long time, the family has been laundering the proceeds of corruption in the U.S. In October 2011, however, the U.S. Department of Justice froze $71 million of Obiang family's wealth in real estate, a private jet, and a Michael Jackson memorabilia. The second, neoliberal institutionalism. The liberal Diffusion theory also have a difficult time explaining why more and more states have adopted treaties, instituting an individual accountability for corruption and human rights crimes. The rationalist scholarship on diffusion explains the why a, the decision of countries A and B affect those of countries C, either by changing incentives or by changing available information. But human rights practices in countries A and B have little direct effect on country C. There are none of externalities, market failure, or possibility for joint gains from international cooperation. 
For scholars working on this trend, uh, tradition, the norm emerges and diffuses in line with the state interest according to the deliberate cost-benefit calculations. But even those of the rationalist orientation, uh, such as Beth Simmons, uh, admit that the spread of international human rights law is more convincingly attributed to normative concerns rather than cooperation in the pursuit of the mutual advantage. Given the lack of the fit between the realist and the neoliberal logics and then the norm of individual accountability, constructivism might seem to provide a better explanation. Norm diffusion has been a central focus of constructivist research. Many studies have examined the spread of human rights norms, though much less attention has been devoted to the corruption cases. The most widely employed constructivist account of norm diffusion is Martha Finnamore and Catherine Sicking's norm life, ci life cycle theory. International norms are said to arise in three phases. The first, emergence. Second, diffusion, or as Finnamore and Sicking argues, uh, the cascade phase. And then finally, internalization. A central element of this framework is the tipping point, which distinguishes the emergence phase from the diffusion phase, the first and the second phase. The norm spread slowly in the earlier phase, mainly through persuasion by the norm entrepreneurs, but then diffused rapidly after the tipping point. The role of the norm entrepreneurs and then the pressure from the like-minded states, which is like a peer pressure, is a central element of the diffusion theory of the constructivism. The final stage is when the norm is taken for granted and produces a rule consistent behavior. The norm life cycle theory advances an S-curve pattern of the diffusion, which begins slowly with a early adopters reaches a tipping point, followed by the cascade, and then with the final holdout lagging the field. The slow, fast, and slow curve, the slow, fast, slow, quick, and slow rates of diffusion may be an accurate, but in many cases, it is more a description rather than an explanation as such. There are important commonality between the sociological institutionalism and constructivism in the IR. Sociological institutionalism helped to inspire the constructivist research program in the 1990s, but, two, but the two have increasingly grown apart. The recent constructivist work on norm diffusion has sought to distance itself from the important tenets of the sociological institutionalism, especially by playing up the role of strategic agency. We believe that these innovations have caused a, the pendulum to swing too far away from the structural concerns. Drawing on the insights of the sociological institutionalism, we argue that the new norms of accountability for corruption and human rights violations are a product of a modernist conception, which emphasizes the rational political authority and individual agency and responsibility. The characterization of the corruption as the abuse of the public office of, for public uh, private gain is uh, directly derived from this worldview. Likewise, the protection of in human rights guaranteed in constitutions has been a critical element of the Weberian notion of the rational legal authority and the primacy of the individual. The anti-corruption and human rights movements were thus in large part a product of their intellectual and cultural environment. Here, we favor the structural expl explanations over the explanations emphasizing the agency for two reasons. The first, structural theories have an important advantage over individualist, individualist account uh, of allowing the multiple realize abilities, where the different combinations of actions and interactions could result in the same outcome. The diffusion studies in constructivism 
have focused too much on the particular actors, usually activists and organizations. Although we acknowledge the significance and the contribution of these actors, we also want to leave a room for the possibility of other actors could have done the same, or other combination of actions could have resulted in the same outcome. And second, structural theories have a high explanatory rate of return because knowing about the structure enables us to explain and perhaps even predict the patterns of actors' behavior, even if we know little about the particular actors. However, we also have to make it clear that the structural explanations are not deterministic. Structure shapes and shoves. Uh, they do not determine the action of agents. The culture guides action but does not determine it. The common criticism of structural theories is that they better explain the stasis and continuity than a change. The structural approach is also criticized of being less effective in explaining which of many possible potential norms all congruent with the cultural structure will rise and diffuse. This weakness is said to illustrate the need for the larger dose of agency as represented in the norm life cycle theory. These scholars have foregrounded agents, especially the norm entrepreneurs intentionally and deliberately acting to create new norms. Often through a case studies of a single norm, these theories provide a nuanced explanation of why specific norms rise, the focusing on the norm entrepreneurs and their organizational platform. Despite these positive contributions, however, there are trade-offs to be made. When you when it comes to the explaining the norm diffusion, the norm life cycle theory has difficulty explaining the source of new norms and then why uh, audience by what norm entrepreneurs are selling. Ideational and normative structures are often treated only as the dependent variable in this type of research, not as a constant environmental factor which both constitutes the agent and shapes their interactions and decisions. We argue in this paper that more complete story or the more complete empirical account of the norm diffusion begins with the structure and then incorporate agency. These kinds of structural explanations do not exclude agency, but most of the explanations, explanatory work is done by the development of progressive structural evolution. In terms, of ex in terms of the relationship between the actors and then their ideational environment, the constructivist account tend to take a causal view, where actors are separated from the norm they are said to create. Therefore, for constructivism, the main carrier of diffusion, such as domestic and international NGOs, epistemic communities, and transnational civil society, are held to be ontologically prior to the cultural environment. For them, agents engage in voluntaristic, purposeful, and intentional actions to cause deliberate normative change. However, there is less attention to the question of where and how the norm entrepreneurs come by their ideas in the very first place. In contrast, structural explanation treats actors as constituted by their cultural environment. A constitutive relationship means that actors are made possible by the structures. This is the reason why we look at the sociological institutionalism for an answer. For sociological institutionalists, the general notion of human rights, individual responsibility, and rational authority are the key features of the general culture of modernity and are prior to individual agents. While individual normal adoptions have, in part, reflected a contingent conjunctions 
the fundamental impetus for emergence and diffusion has been the expansion of the culture of modernity, which cannot be reduced to the individual agent. Rather than ignoring the role of NGOs, international organizations, and transnational policy communities, sociological institutionalism sees these actors as a crucial to a process of theorizing problems and solutions. In other words, the long-term, the macro-cultural trend constitutes individual agents and uh, rationalized impersonal authority. Then, the bounded exercise of agency in the process of theorization instantiates these norms. The structure provides the condition of possibility, indeed a probability for the norm to rise. This overarching cultural structure constitutes actors and then sets a boundary condition for their agency, notably in the composition of categories, problems, and solutions. Actors diagnose the problems from the internal tension between the cultural tropes and in the way external developments, developments are ca um, classified. The solutions are the cause and effect stories or the models that confirm to, elaborate, and entrench the specific feature of the world cultural tenets. Following Strang and Meyer, we refer to this process as a theorization. New norms mandating individual accountability for corruption and human rights offenses were much more a product of the prior deep-seated modernist worldview than a de novo creation of norm entrepreneurs or the idiosyncratic responses to the particular national circumstances. However, this does not mean that the agency did not play any role at all. On the contrary, the proximate process, how the cultural structure led to a specific norms was the process of theorization involving agency. The actors began their problem, uh, began with a problem deri derived from an overarching cultural framework, which also created a responsibility to advance a solution. Agents then created uh, creatively drew upon the broader cultural tropes to create craft a potential solutions. Although this process comprises uncoordinated action by autonomous agents working in the separate field of the corruption and human rights, there were pronounced similarity in the norms that they resulted, which is the individual accountability norm. These similarities not only were a product of the structurally driven menu of options from which actors chose, but also reflected, uh, reflects the winnowing effect, whereby norms that are more closely anchored in fundamental cultural precepts were more likely to win acceptance. Thus, although the resulting norms of individual accountability were the proximate result of actors' agency, this outcome, which is diffusion of the norm, was mainly shaped by the boundary conditions of the cultural structure in the very first place. When individual norms are in studied separately, scholars tend to give more attention to agency and less to structure. However, we found that the reverse is the case by zooming out to explore the close similarity between two norms of corruption and human rights. The close similarities between development of two norms, despite the near complete separation of transnational actors, is a good indication of the importance of background structural factors. That two such norms should arise at the same time without conscious borrowing or cross-fertilization between the actors strongly signals the primacy of the contextual factors. Such background tends to be obscured in case studies of just one norm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Kim. Uh, this is also a very interesting paper, but very difficult to understand. 
he briefly mentions he wanna explain kind of new ground to justify the emergence of a new norms or duties or principled beliefs in, in international community. And he put aside those previous explanation about such a duty, like uh, a realist approach and neoliberal approach, and, and also social constructivism. Then he wanna suggest a sociological institutional approach. Um, we may need a discussion to help to clarify the reasoning of those sociological institutionality, especially the structure and agency and the law of the cultural environment and, and many, many things. Okay, let's uh, move to the discussion to uh, comment. The first three, the uh, Professor Beck Bomsa from Asan Institute uh, regarding uh, Professor Lamirez's presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you for uh, 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 no, you thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss on uh, Professor Ramirez's uh, very interesting presentation today. Uh, after the birth of the UDHR in 1948, uh, international human rights uh, law developed rapidly with the emergence of a growing uh, number of uh, human rights treaties. And indeed, the international committees have made an effort to legalize the fundamental human rights within the UN framework. Though such an internationalization of human rights is still a work in progress, uh, their focus has gradually uh, moved to the internalization of human rights, as Professor Ramirez pointed out in his uh, previous article. He, today he highlights that the emergence of NHRI to the development of international human rights law as the outcome of a long process which has begun over 50 years ago and which closely intervened with the gradual strengthening of the international human rights regime. NHRIs are, however, still a new actor in the UN uh, structures and Rachel Murray argues it is still very much open to debate what role NHRIs will play in national, regional, and international human rights arena. So, in this sense, uh, today's uh, uh, presentation is indeed a meaningful work to show the way in which NHRIs uh, have worked in the development of ind individual uh, state human rights mechanisms. So, that is the Professor Ramirez examined the effect of NHRIs, and to answer this question, he argues that the effect of NHRIs is stronger for physical integrity abuses than for civil and uh, political rights violations, though it is not straightforwardly linear, but change and enhance gradually over time. In addition, he stressed that the effect of NHRIs is substantively uniform, no matter they are in the form of national human rights commissions, ombudsman offices, or hybrid circles. So my first interpretation of his presentation on the efficacy of NHRIs and individual uh, states' commitment is the following. The, est the establishment of NHRIs itself, like the ratification of international human rights treaties, cannot be directly linked to the enhancement of the human rights in individual states. It, however, has been a driving force for all rights stakeholders, including civil societies and NGOs, to mobilize for better human rights practices. And with NHRIs, uh, they have a means and motives to demand changes on government's human rights policies for the effective implementation of international human rights norms. Even when government in initially intended to establish them with insincere motivation, with insincere motivation. So furthermore, uh, from normative perspective, I think first NHRIs can bring the gap between the international community, including the UN, and the indi uh, individual government on the understanding of international human rights norms. In addition, NHRIs can provide the human rights education programs both to the former uh, educational uh, institutions and the general public. And such work is important 
to raise public awareness on uh, human rights because it is a long process to understand what is human rights, to detect whether there is human rights violation, and finally know uh, where the remedy for violations can be sued, especially for people who have lived under Australian authoritarian government for a long time. And lastly, by their cooperation with the civil society, by sharing information and identifying human rights issues of common concern, they can enhance the capacity of individual states for better human rights practices. And here are some questions that I would like to ask Professor Lamilis. First, you focused on the two categories of rights, physical integrity and civil and political rights. And I would like to know when you describe the protection of physical integrity rights, whether it can be considered as same as the jus cogens norms or the, the peremptory norms of international uh, law or not. It is because in case of a jus cogens norms, for example, torture, everyone agrees that it is not allowed in any circumstances. But there are disagreements when and in what situation uh, it can be considered as torture. And second, when you describe civil and uh, political rights, you emphasize that they are subject to greater cross-cultural variation. And in case of economic, social, and cultural rights, they are much more subject to cross-cultural variations. So I wonder whether you think the NHRI will have a stronger effect on civil and political vari violations than on uh, economic, social, or uh, and cultural rights or not. Lastly, in my not be really relevant questions on your presentation, but would like to hear your or any thoughts on the issue of increasing concern on National Human Rights Commission of Korea uh, since 2009. Uh, the previous government reduced the commission's staff by 21%, and most of whom were recruited from civil society. And to make uh, and the NHRCK, the National Human Rights Commission of Korea, has increasingly been subordinated to the government. As a result, the NHRCK has kept silent on sensitive human rights violation issues that are li directly related to the government. Uh, overall, there are concerns that all ongoing troubles in the commission may be a step back in the development of human rights in Korea. However, there are also increasing number of efforts by all rights stakeholders, including civil society and NGOs, to regain and ensure the Commission's independence and effectiveness with more dynamic discussions on its credibility and legitimacy as a NHRI. So such interactions may prove to have a significant effect on raising the capacity of NHRIs in the future for better protection and promotion of human rights. So, I would like to hear your any thoughts on this issue too. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And now let's hear from Professor Kim Jae-won. Patricia Kelly and uh, I have uh, 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 almost little things uh, to disagree on this topic. So uh, I would like to just highlight uh, some of uh, uh, Po some of the points uh, she made, uh, and uh, I'd like to add uh, some some of my comment. And uh, I, I think uh, Robert Kelly was uh, correct to point out the many uh, different uh, usage of the term of uh, human rights lawyering in uh, Korean context, because uh, even though the the Lawyers Act. Uh, itself uh, said that the basic role of the the mission mission of the, the Korean lawyer is to uh, to to protect the human rights and to further uh, to enhance uh, uh, social justice uh, it, it is my understanding that uh, most uh, mainstream Korean lawyers uh, have some uh, psychological resistance to use uh, human rights lawyering because of uh, some historical uh, attachment to, uh, to this term. Uh, because of this uh, resistance, uh, as Professor uh, Kedi mentioned, uh, it is a new trend uh, to use uh, public interest lawyering or public interest law instead of human rights lawyering these days. And uh, uh, as we saw, uh, during the presentation, uh, there are some uh, major law firms in Korea these days uh, to establish uh, public interest 
law committee uh, to help uh, this kind of uh, effort. Uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, better than nothing to have such uh, effort from uh, big law firms, but uh, we do uh, concern about uh, some conflict of interest problems uh, from uh, uh, the legal ethics uh, point because uh, many law firms uh, are uh, working for uh, corporate interest and uh, there are many uh, uh, public interest law issues uh, raised against uh, corporate uh, interest. Because of that, uh, uh, there are inherent uh, limitations uh, for uh, big law firms to do engage in uh, search work. So uh, to me, uh, it is rather uh, practical or uh, realistic for uh, law firms if they are interest, really interested in uh, public interest law, uh, uh, it would be better to provide a fellowship uh, to uh, uh, law students who are interested in uh, public interest law rather than uh, uh, doing uh, uh, those works by themselves. And uh, I also want to point out uh, the educational uh, reform, uh, especially a new law school system in Korea, uh, in terms of this uh, uh, human rights uh, diffusion, because uh, as, as we saw uh, in the slides, a uh, substantial number of lawyers uh, have involved in this uh, uh, human rights work uh, in last decades, and because of that, uh, the, to educate future lawyers uh, 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 in, in their educational settings uh, to learn more about and to better understand the human rights is uh, critical for uh, human rights diffusion uh, outside the legal arena. Uh, but uh, to me, uh, it seems that uh, it, the Human rights education is not properly uh, done uh, in law school curriculum because uh, the still uh, human rights issues are uh, limited within uh, uh, international law and uh, constitutional law. Uh, because of this uh, limitation, uh, I don't see uh, the well-balanced uh, education uh, on this topic uh, has been uh, uh, provided to uh, pro uh, prospective uh, lawyers uh, in, even in a new system. So uh, uh, I also uh, agree with uh, Professor Getty about uh, the importance of a legal ed clinic uh, in a new system because this is the, almost the first place for future lawyers to learn about uh, uh, human rights issues uh, in, uh, in, uh, with a live client and uh, in, in a real context. So uh, I think uh, it would be uh, uh, very important uh, for us to, uh, to, to to realize and understand the importance of this uh, legal clinical education uh, for a uh, human rights diffusion uh, context. Uh, uh, I will stop here and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kim. And thirdly, let's hear from Professor Sa. Hey, thank you. Uh, <coughs> First of, first of all, I'd like to uh, mention that I'm not really a specialist here. I'm, I teach Chinese politics, and my research area is Chinese nationalism. But still, you know, I, I really enjoyed you know, your writing the uh, paper and also your presentation, because this paper is dealing with a very fundamental issues in social science, uh, simply speaking, structure and agency. And uh, in my field, you know, the theory of nationalism, uh, there are lots of heated theoretical debates regarding how, how to deal with this uh, structure. And then inside of that uh, structure of 
discourses of nationalism and inside of that how, how each individual actually, you know, gaining uh, agency by making one's own positions or, or reshaping uh, its structure. Then uh, I could see that in this uh, writing, that, uh, you know, okay, this international human rights and corruption, the discourses, uh, the structure of discourses and the, the way uh, individual agency is performing in this structure and interacting each other is, is not much different. Especially, I appreciate your efforts to uh, not sacrificing anything, you know, both structure and agency. I think the issue first came when uh, Williams were criticized uh, that a scotch ball. Uh, regarding uh, the how revolution happens, and then uh, you know, William Sewell's uh, point was that a Scotch Bureau totally forgot about the issue of agency. And then, since 1980s, in explaining social changes, the uh, the issue of agency gaining more and more significance. And actually, I, I did my research in theoretical field, but in this institutional. Once and it's been a long time for me to read about this uh, issue of structure and agency in, in global institution or social institution and, and norms. So I, I really welcome this and this compromise. You know about the agency. I have a little detail. You know the issue regarding how to define this agency because in my field, in my research, actually I don't really care whether agency has uh, distinct norms or values because uh, agencies, even with the same norms or values, they can still uh, change the uh, structure. That is actually came from anthropological tradition of Victor Turner, then in, in dramatology and everything. They all agree with that, but simply by participating in, uh, in ceremony or in the social institution, maybe you participate too much or too less, itself already changing the structure. So the, the concept of agency is not really a uh, matter with uh, the issue of distinctive norms in, in, uh, in, in social sphere. So that part, I, I'm just uh, curious about how, how you think. And where this, uh, for me as a uh, Foucauldian, uh, the issue of modernity, you know, the definition of modernity, as, 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 it's not I'm, I'm criticizing you or, or giving a specific comments on this paper, but I guess we can have a lot of discussions, you know, regarding uh, these kinds of discussion can be, you know, multiplied by simply, you know, using different concepts. Yeah, so you, you, it seems you stick to uh, Max Weber's uh, concept of modernity, the issue of modern rationality, but uh, where from Foucauldian perspective, that's a little bit very much different. You know? And so how to deal with that? Especially, I, I don't really uh, think modernity can be defined as a singular concept. So modernity itself can be understood as a, uh, a field of discussion in which very contradictory discourses are fighting each other to gain the legitimacy as a, a, as a modernity. That's what happened, I guess, throughout the 20th century. And, and also the issue of individuality, too. You know, this individuality is, I guess, also very much a Weberian concept. And, but you criticize this uh, Individuality, you know, this this constructivism, who regard individual as a as a constitute of you know, or product of structure, but uh, that's a little bit different uh, in, in Foucauldian perspective. How individual is constructed in in, in our discursive power, and I, you know, this discussion can be very interesting if we can just focus on this the issue of individuality and agency and have a, a further discussion, then I think it'll be very interesting. But, but you know, I'm not going to make uh, further uh, comments, but I, I hope we can have a further discussion over the lunch. But I appreciate this paper a lot because this is us really paving a way to, uh, or, or uh, providing us a, a starting point of whole new discussions regarding uh, agency structure over the issue of uh, human rights and, and, and corruption. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you all the discussion. Uh, Professor Sir's discussions actually make the things much difficult <laughs> rather than <laughs> yeah. I mean it's a decent, very decent and beautiful, but it's also very difficult to understand that those discussions. Uh, okay. Uh, let's hear from Flos if you have any questions to present us and even discuss on this. You have a you raise uh, your hand and then identify yourself. Okay, over there, please. Hello. Hello. Yeah, my name is uh, John Smith. I'm a PhD student from Zhuang University. I'm a human rights activist from Myanmar. I have some question to Professor Hun Jun Kim. <laughs> about uh, human rights standard and all, how do you feel? Is there any relevant from Asian context, Asian value or Confucian culture? Is an including human rights norm present uh, current international norm and standard? Or at the beginning of drafting human rights, there was a Chinese representative as vice president in drafting. So, but many Asians still criticize it is not Asian context. So how do you feel? Can you explain more a little bit? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And any, any other? Okay, Professor Ku. Um, I have a question to Professor Algeri. Um, I think, um, you nicely demonstrated the diffusion of um, maybe um, public interest law and pro bono activities um, in different uh, fields. And I was especially intrigued by your argument that um, public interest law, the discourse related to that, uh, began to expand in the private sector, uh, including uh, private law firms, not only in uh, universities and schools, but also in the private sector. So you, I think, uh, uh, it, it began with um, the second phase you identified uh, from the 1990s, um, where we saw the kind of shift from the human rights discourse to the public law discourse. I found that quite interesting uh, in terms of understanding the nature of human rights diffusion in this country. Uh, since um, one of our aims is to compare and contrast on different fields, and law, institutions, education, uh, people's consciousness, social movements, uh, because of that, I was wondering um, uh, if the evidence you provide might serve as the sheer evidence suggesting that human rights discourse has ha had a hard time in diffusing itself in the law field. Because uh, it sounds like in the 1990s, like, uh, the activists and uh, stakeholders realized that it wouldn't be that good strategy to uh, stick with the discourse of human rights because of a lot of uh, responses and um, challenges uh, facing uh, themselves. So I was wondering to what extent you can say that human rights have diffused in the legal field. Um, that, 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 that's the question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from students? Okay. Professor Tucci. Is it on? Okay, uh, 10 years ago I would have pretended that I was a student, but I'm getting too old for that. Um, and I'm going to try to be quick, but I have comments and questions for each one of the presenters. Uh, on, on Chiki's presentation, um, since you made some speculative comments about uh, beyond decoupling, um, I'll make some speculative remarks in response. Um, so what's, what's legitimated, uh, legitimated decoupling? Um, my thinking here is that, um, well, so the tension between universal human rights and cultural relativism has been discussed extensively and that there's, there's always this inherent tension uh, within international human rights discourse and that's because at some point cultural rights, uh, minority cultural rights especially, became part of human rights. And that right there in lies this inherent tension between the two because if you allow 
uh, cultural relativism to come into the discussion, then you have to allow uh, some exceptions in that. That's when uh, decoupling gets legitimated. Um, so that's, that might be a direction that uh, could be productive in thinking about what kind of decoupling can be legitimated and accepted. Um, and uh, one of the key findings that you presented is uh, uh, the, the kinds of human rights outcomes do matter and physical integrity rights um, because um, they are more accepted, more of a global uh, consensus exists on that topic than on civil and political rights, and that, that's an important factor. And here you're comparing two of the more strongest, uh, two of the probably strongest uh, rights areas, uh, even civil and political rights, freedom of association, uh, democracy, th those are very strong rights among, if you look at the, if you uh, can imagine a uh, sort of hierarchy of rights, and those are the top two, and you go down the list and then economic rights, social rights, cultural rights. So um, even the, one of the stronger international human rights uh, is not doing too well in your, in your analysis. So I wonder what might come out if you look at economic rights or cultural rights, indigenous peoples, autonomy rights, and all those things. Um, uh, I don't know if you've done the analysis, but that, that's one direction you could go in. And, and some of the discussion that in your paper um, um, actually jive with uh, Professor Kim's uh, piece. By the way, I, I thought your presentation was really fantastic. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, been, I've become accustomed to, accustomed to a PowerPoint presentation, it, and in this jet lag state of mind, it, it would have been very difficult to focus on a non-PowerPoint presentation, but I really uh, was captivated uh, by your presentation, and I really enjoyed it. And, um, but toward the end, I, I, I wanted to uh, hear some clarification from you. Um, you mentioned that norms that are strongly embedded in the cultural pre precepts of modernity, so core ideas of modernity emanate, and um, um, those that are most, um, that have strong af affinity with the core idea of modernity are more likely to succeed in the contemporary world. Now, uh, there's a danger of teleology there. I mean, you know, the, the, those rights, uh, uh, discourses, uh, individual accountability rights, uh, maybe because the, it's closer to the core idea of modernity, it succeeded. But it seems that way because it succeeded, right? So I wonder, in, in terms of research strategy, how you disentangle that uh, uh, sort of difficult, uh, complicated relationship between those two. On um, uh, Professor Getty's presentation, uh, this might not be that directly relevant, but um, I'm wondering what you see as um, uh, lawyers or uh, uh, legal advocacy organizations' role in the broader social movements for human rights, in, in South Korea specifically. Because uh, I mean, you cite Sarat and Scheingold and those cause lawyer in literature. And there's some concern in, uh, among the scholars who draw on that literature that uh, the, the, the picture they present is like, too happy. Right? And um, you, know, you also had a relatively rosy picture of dynamic and synergistic networking effects with NGOs. But there are some groups that um, uh, are kind of feel like dominated by lawyers and legal advocacy organizations because of the massive resource capacity that legal advocacy organizations have. And um, there's also some concerns that uh, lawyers, uh, legal advocacy organizations don't take input from grassroots level. And their arguments, their claims, whether those claims represent grassroots concerns or not, there's some question mark on that too. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Okay. Uh, thank you. You have a, the, the many insightful questions and comments. Uh, Professor Kim and Professor Geddes has a academic duty at Songgyongan University, so let's give the first chance to reply to okay. Professor Geddes. Thank you for all the valuable comments. Um, in response to what Professor Kim Jae-won mentioned about uh, the, uh, they're all valid points, uh, and I, I didn't have a chance to, to address many of the, the items in detail, but I, I agree with the fact that the, the curriculum does not adequately take into account um, educating about international human rights law for the, for the law student body. I teach those courses and it is, it is a very hard, uh, it's very hard for me to try to convince more students to come to these classes because they're quite focused on the bar exam courses. So that, that is one obstacle. Um, as for Professor Ku's question about um, the difficulty of, of the language of human rights discourse being absorbed into the legal profession, and, and Professor Kim Ji-won also mentioned that, that as well. 
you know, that's the legacy of the, the leftist ideology that, that many of the, the incumbiones, the human rights lawyers, were having to deal with by representing students and laborers, laborers during, um, during the 1970s and early 1980s. So that, that stigma, there's actually a stigma to the, the term of human rights in the legal field, and that's, that's in part why public interest law is, is more attractive, it's more neutralized, it's more pr a professionalized term that I think is more uh, acceptable to the legal profession. To what extent has human rights discourse spread further in the legal field beyond the legal profession? I, I don't have time to talk about that right now, but that's, that's also been challenging. The one example though is that Kongam has um, come back you know, full circle to using human rights uh, as their their group title, I, I think that says something. We've we've moved enough. You know, it's been a few decades now since the 1970s. Um, so I think with the younger generation, the newer generation of, of legal professionals, uh, that stigma we're losing that stigma with the phrase international uh, with the phrase human rights. So I think we'll see actually more currency um, with human rights being used again. And then in terms of the pictures being too rosy, I agree. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of criticisms about the role of public interest law groups uh, globally. Um, in the US, there are many, many examples of that. Here also, um, I, I know the lawyers, they, they really try to be in, really on the ground, um, but there are so few. My, 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 I think the bigger concern is that there there are only three <laughs> in all of South Korea, and there are less than 10 lawyers in each group. So, so the question is uh, really, are they, are they, is this adequately, you know, is this institutionally adequate to, to serve uh, the, the needs of the entire Korean population? Of course not. Um, so there's an undersupply here, and they're all here in Seoul. So what about the, the rest of, of the country, the population outside of Seoul? Um, this is where NGOs have to really uh, thump the ground and try to um, uh, get legal aid access um, outside of Seoul. So that's, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges to, to deal with there, and I, and I wish we could talk more about it, but we actually have to run outside of this room uh, to our... Um, our faculty meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lamirez, please. Is this working? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I want to answer the last question. That, that the, the question was whether there was some kind of interaction effect. And it, it's also implied in Professor uh, Tsutsui's question, which is, uh, our paper had a very limited objective. It, it was, is there a relationship between national human rights commissions and, and human rights outcomes? It's, it's different from asking the question, through what process or what are the mechanisms through which this relationship holds? And one of the reasons I concentrated on the case of Indonesia is it suggested one mechanism, which is, and it's a mechanism that Professor Sutsui, I believe, uh, way back actually identified, which is, if you have a human rights climate, in this case, concretely, if you have a National Human Rights Commission, you're more likely to create human rights activism, which can take the form of a social movement. Okay, so there are two ways of thinking about it. One is to think that really what's going on, a human rights commission creates human rights activism, which then results in uh, a better human rights record. In the case of Indonesia, quite concretely, five years after they created the commission, Suharto was ousted. Okay, and that was quite crucial in bringing about the change. Um, another way of thinking about it is to think about it in terms of some kind of statistical interaction, where you're more likely to get more leverage out of a National Human Rights Commission if you have student activism, I mean, not student, if you have human rights activism. I, I don't know which of these makes better sense, but there are ways of trying to tackle that. Um, no, I have not uh, actually done the analysis on, on social and economic rights, but I assume that the impact of national rights co commissions would be weaker even because they are less consensually agreed upon. Okay? Um, and I think your, your, your point is quite interesting and valid, which is, wow, they don't even work for political and civil rights. You have to really be at the extreme in terms of physical integrity for there to work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Professor Kim. Okay, uh, thank you very much for um, your comments, uh, Professor So. Uh, I'll 
come up with uh, two answers to your uh, two very highly valid points. The first one is about the, the relationship between the agents and then structure and whether the participation itself is it's a really difficult uh, distangle these the structure and agents and then that was the also then the thing I was trying to do in our paper which is to see capture the interaction part of the, the structure and agency and then the reason why we did that is because the whole trend in current current trend in study of diffusion of in international relations are focusing too much on the agency these days and then focusing on the, the too much much on the normal entrepreneurs and then their roles. So we were trying. To, so within that context, we were trying to move further away from that explanation and to see the structural environment and then the interactions of it. So that's the kind of structural thing. And then the, of course, uh, sh sure we are following the sociological institutionalism and then they spend more time examining the modernity than we do. So, um, but that didn't really came up to me uh, about this different notion of modernity. So of course we use the Weberian notion of modernity and how that has been evolved. But I think that the Foucauldian is certainly different and then we, but, but in this paper we even didn't try to open up the, the, the box of wor warm, good can of worms, the modernity. So we bracket it within this, this uh, the understanding of sociological institutionalism. But I think certainly opening up the box of the modernity and the individuality is the something that I have to pursue in the next uh, next uh, papers. And then uh, for your comments, um, sorry I didn't get your name. Um, about Asian value and how that has been incorporated in the whole diffusion of international human rights norms is that certainly uh, in the field of what I do is a, is a particular field of transitional justice. It's about uh, human rights prosecutions and truth commissions. In that part, Asian value and then Asian perspective is still, Asia in particular is the least, um, uh, is a country with the least number of truth commissions and then uh, and then human rights prosecutions. So in that, I think it's a human, uh, in terms of Asia in general, you know, is kind of an exception to the whole global trend of a transitional justice. But I'm, um, so that's the kind of my answer and my take. And then the finally, uh, Professor uh, Zuzui, um, your, um, thank you very much for your comments. And then the answer I have is that in our paper, what we've tried is that because of that very exactly that problem of whether, because since we are looking at the succeeded norms of individual accountability, but we have examined, so there has been an in comparison between the cases within each norms. So the norm of human rights and the norm of corruption. So individual accountability norm, which fits the modernity or the individuality, was not the only solution that the activist or the agent came up with in the hi course of history. The other powerful alternative was uh, holding the state accountable. So that was a totally different model than holding the individual leaders accountable. So that model, and then this individual account model, in the course of evolution competed with each other. And then we examine how this uh, state accountability model, which holds the state, not, not the state leaders, but the state, the whole state as a, 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 a whole state as, as a responsible, did not succeed um, in the course of the course of the development. So that was uh, in, in, in comparison between uh, the succeeding model and then the failure model. And then that's the, how we came up with the conclusion that the, this kind of, the one that fits with modernity or the, moder or the culture of modernity has somewhat winnowing effect of um, narrowing down the menu of option and the, or making a certain option more powerful or more making certain options less powerful in terms of a, a model. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have a very rich and comprehensive the sessions from the contemporary Korean history focusing on human rights development to a worldwide comparison of a national human rights institutions and to eventually the theoretical understanding of a new kind of international duty or norms. Uh, I learned a lot and hopefully you too enjoyed the, these panels. Uh, thank you on the audience and thank you insightful discussant and thank you the distinguished thank you.
present this. Uh, let's stop here and then close the session. Thank you very much indeed.